I'd like to welcome you to our safety meeting today. Um, we are going to be talking about behaviors that are that create jeopardy or cause problems uh, or could cause an accident. So driving behaviors mostly. So let's just um, just our little disclaimer here. This instruction is prepared for beach transportation. Uh, we are a school bus company. This is part of the annual training time that drivers need to stay certified as bus drivers. So um, this is made for beach transportation. This is our January safety meeting. So let me share my screen with you. Okay, so we're going to talk about, like I said, behaviors that cause problems uh, or could cause an accident. So jeopardy, let's just move right along here. Um, before we get started, if you are a beach transportation school bus driver, you will need to have the summary sheet that is has been prepared for January. On that summary sheet will be some questions and you will answer those questions toward the second half of this presentation. So you don't need to fill in anything right now except for your name. Put your name on there and uh, we'll get to the questions in a few minutes. So Jeopardy is danger. Jeopardy is a risk of loss, a loss of life, a loss of time, a loss of vehicle. It's a risk of harm, harm to your passengers, to yourself, to the vehicle. A risk of death or destruction. So it's not just a game show we're talking about. And I know I enjoy watching Jeopardy as a game, but it's called Jeopardy because you risk your money as you're playing if you answer the questions incorrectly. So today we're gonna to talk about behaviors. This is an example of jeopardy. Now, as drivers, we don't always cause those bad things to happen. Sometimes accidents, well, incidents happen because another driver runs into our school bus. Uh, that's the way we'd like those incidents to shake out. We don't want our drivers to cause those accidents. Uh, an accident is really not an accident, and I think we've talked about this before, but someone causes the collision. So the bus driver does not always make the bad choice and put the bus in jeopardy. Sometimes that's because another person, another driver has caused, done something that has caused two vehicles to run into each other. Okay, what are some things that we do that put ourselves and our passengers in jeopardy or at risk? We're gonna talk about those today. So with our pre-trip, this was a picture the mechanics took. Think about what kind of injury or jeopardy this could put someone in if it's left undetected. The biggest thing is that this could fly out the back and hit the windshield of another car that's behind the bus. This rock could get wedged down in there far enough that it causes one of the tires to be damaged. Uh, where it would blow. So part of your pre-trip should be checking your wheels, um, overlooking or doing a quick pre-trip could cause an accident. Leaving your mirrors unadjusted. And it's always been, you know, a little bit aggravating when I substitute on a bus in the afternoon when the driver has driven in the morning and I get on their bus and those front crossover mirrors are not adjusted at all. They're still 
flattened out or way to the side, how we have to sometimes put them when we park in the garages. So how what would leaving a mirror unadjusted, what kind of jeopardy would that put you in? For one, if you were changing lanes and your mirrors weren't adjusted, you could run into another vehicle. If you're turning a corner and you don't use your mirrors, you could run over a car or a curb or a post or a sign. Uh, the biggest thing are these crossover mirrors. If we don't use those, if they're not adjusted correctly, and of course we have to use them, a student could get injured because we might move the bus while they're in the danger zone. The biggest reason that these crossover mirrors are there are for those students in front of the bus. So. Okay, we only watch one side or one corner of the bus. When we get our buses in a tight position, this driver was coming down the road, they need to pull in in front of this car to park along the curb. Um, as they were pulling up, they were watching something else, probably where the bus needed to be up in front and got too close to this car and caught it just as it made contact. And the driver did a really smart thing at that point, and that was that they stopped. Um, sometimes we get in a situation where it's very tight and we're focused on something else, and part of our bus makes contact that we weren't watching. When you are in a position where your bus is tight, where you don't have a lot of space, that's when we have to slow down, we have to watch our mirrors, and we have to be slow enough that we can watch all four corners of our buses or all sides of our buses. Crossing railroad tracks without stopping can put you and your passengers in jeopardy or at risk. Uh, in Missoula, I know all of you are a little frustrated with the, the Missoula railroad tracks, but from south of town until way up there by Broadway and Spruce, the tracks that run through our town north and south direction are inactive. They're basically dead tracks. Um, they've been paved over in places where a train could not move on those tracks. And I know that, that you're frustrated that you can't just go over those because they're dead. But until the signage is removed, until they become completely paved over with no signage, we have to legally stop at those. Um, I talked to RailLink about this situation, and it's all been turned over to the city. And we know how things get done in the city sometimes. So just be patient, continue to stop. It's been part of your routine for years. Don't, uh, don't overthink it. Don't get frustrated. We do have tracks, however, that run from east to west in our valley or west to east. And those are very busy tracks. They're uh, fast moving trains in part of those um, out of the Bonner Clinton area, uh, Desmet area, going up the Rattlesnake, coming down the Rattlesnake on the west side. Please be aware, please stop. Don't put yourself in jeopardy by being complacent with that. Okay, rushing through yellow lights. I don't know how many of you notice, but um, people don't necessarily stop very well at yellow lights. They go through, two or three cars will go through a light, sometimes after it's turned completely red. We put ourselves out into a position where we are pushing those yellow lights. It puts us out into an intersection where those who have the green light are starting to move. And at that point, it becomes your fault if there's um, a collision. So how do we decide when we stop at a yellow light? If your nose, the nose of your bus, is out in the intersection or at the edge of the intersection when that light turns yellow, 
you can keep going. You shouldn't have to accelerate. You should just keep going and you'll get through that intersection. However, if your bus is a bus length or two bus lengths from that light when it turns yellow, that doesn't mean you push the accelerator. It means you touch the brake and slow down and stop for that yellow light because it's going to turn green. I mean, it's going to turn red, sorry. I was thinking of stale green lights. Another thing to watch is the countdown on the crosswalks. And some of those are not accurate, and you know which one's on your bus route. But we've always said a stale green light, one that's been green for a long period of time, is a signal to you that that light's going to change soon. So watch those stale green lights. And then slow down, don't just push the accelerator when you see a yellow light. Turning into the wrong lane, choosing lanes when we drive is important. And as we turn a corner, we should be in the farthest outside lane to give us the most turning radius. Um, there are exceptions, I know that, but most of the time you should be in the outside turning lane. Okay, backing without looking or without a spotter. If your bus is parked in a garage, as you approach that bus, you should start your pre-trip. You should be looking at which buses are close to you that might cause a problem. Am I straight with the garage? This bus was not, it was parked between two doors and backed right up into the beam. Um, you've got to know what's around your bus especially when you're backing, what's behind you, what's on the sides of you. And we should never back without a spotter. Think about where we've asked you never to back, never to back up your bus. And that would be at the school. Because those school zones are so busy with walkers and other vehicles and bikes, kids playing, we don't want to be pulling into a school zone and then backing up where we have limited vision. So no backing in school zones. And if you do need to back up, um, know what's behind you. Uh, do a, Have a spotter if you can. Mini buses especially, use your attendants and let them know what you're looking at. Don't just assume they know. Okay, pulling out in front of traffic. We have timed it that when a big bus is coming from a side street pulling onto a main street, it takes four full seconds to get your turn and get straight on that main street. So four seconds, if you're looking at your following distance, which you should be doing all the time is, is that distance, oftentimes it's three quarters of a block to a block away before you should turn out in front of a, another vehicle. So watch that so you don't, this, this driver pulled across Reserve Street, four lanes of traffic. Um, they weren't turning on to Reserve, they were cutting across Reserve Street. We never, never should be crossing four lanes of traffic or turning on to four lanes of traffic, turning left is, is just not something we wanna do because this is kind of the result of the driver's choice that put that bus in jeopardy. Uh, no, we don't have buses that look like this, although some of the general public tend to think we do. Um, we can't drive fast with our buses. We've got to obey the speed limit. Uh, oftentimes a bus, because it's loud, um, kind of heavy, they can misjudge the speed and having your lights on makes makes it look like you're driving faster than you are. But please don't drive over the speed limit. We've had many discussions about speeding. You cannot react to what's going on around you when you're going fast. You've got to know what's around you. You've got to keep a space around you and not speed. Okay, these two buses were following too close. They were following each other too close, but they were also following this semi-truck too close. These two buses were on a field trip together. 
I'm sure they were traveling close because they didn't want to get separated and not know where they, they were going. But what you don't realize is that under this first bus is a car. Um, when this semi truck had to lock up his brakes, the little car behind slowed to try to avoid the semi. But at that point, this first bus hit the little car and drove him up on the bed of the semi truck, the trailer, and then piled up on top. Um, the person in that little car was killed. Um, there were injuries, multiple injuries on the buses um, because of following distance. You cannot stop the buses very quickly when you're going over 45 miles an hour. So we ask you to, first of all, have a four second following distance if you're in town going less than 45 miles an hour. <clears throat> If you go over that 45 miles an hour, you need to add another second of following distance. If it's dark, you would add another fo second following distance. If it's icy or inclement weather, add another second. So basically, anything over 45 miles an hour, any hazard needs to be added into one second following distance for each hazard snow, rain, speed, dark. Okay, we put our, our bus and our children in jeopardy if we leave the bus stop without checking the danger zone. This is a really crucial point that we need to watch is when our students are outside the bus, Oftentimes we'll have students get off the bus and walk down along the side. They got to check their mail. Um, maybe they live behind where the bus stopped and maybe there are no sidewalks for them to walk on it. So if you have a student alongside the bus, if you have anybody around that bus crossing in front, you need to wait and watch until the danger zone is clear before you move the bus. Don't just say, well, they're at the mailbox. If I go really slow, I can go past them and then hurry up on my route. Hurrying and being on time at that point is not the most important thing. It's protecting that danger zone, protecting the kids that are in that danger zone. Okay, leaving the bus without checking for sleeping children can put them at, in jeopardy. They can put your job in jeopardy. Um, this little guy was left on a school bus. Um, the driver lost his job over this, but I want you to think of the repercussions of this little child being left. Now, if we've got below zero temperatures coming in the next week, maybe toward the end of this week, if you were to leave this little guy on a school bus, how long do you think he would physically last if he was buckled in and couldn't get out? Um, maybe with a coat on, but he doesn't look like he's a real big guy. Um, hypothermia probably on a bus could set in within a couple hours. Um, and hypothermia could cause death if he wasn't found soon enough. If it was hot out, and he was in that bus, you know how hot it is when you, sometimes you get in, that could cause uh, death. Uh, plus the traumatic experience these kids have when they're locked in a place where they can't get out, they don't know where they are. Picture yourself maybe in the mall at the end of the evening, the mall's closing down, you, you go in to use the restroom and you get in the wrong room, and let's say it's a closet, you get locked in, and this is all hypothetical, of course, but put yourself in a position where you're unable to free yourself from your position. You don't know where you are, it's dark, uh, nobody can help you, becomes fairly um, anxious to our ourselves. And being trapped in a bus or being left on a bus can be very traumatizing for these little people. Okay, the driver of this job 
um, that that drove this little boy did lose his job. Uh, so that's a, a big possibility. Okay, what are some of the reasons that we make these bad decisions as we're driving a, a big bus or a little bus? Uh, just a few of those reasons are complacency. You know, we've done this over and over. It's it, We could do it in our sleep. Uh, we know the route, we know the hazards, but those hazards don't always have to be fixed hazards. Sometimes they're moving hazards, whether it's a car or a deer or a person, a bike. And if we're not watching, if we're not attentive, that can put us in jeopardy of, of an accident or a, an incident where there's injury. Sometimes we become distracted. There's lots of things that can distract us when we're driving. Maybe your phone goes off in your pocket. You, you wonder who it is. You feel the vibration. You hear the ringing. So it kind of distracts you. The kids on your bus can become a distraction. Um, them making noises, yelling, fighting, throwing things, whatever. On a minibus, your attendant can be a distraction if they're talking to you, asking you questions. A lot of ways we can become distracted on as school bus drivers. Okay, we're rushing, we're in a hurry. We left the, the office a little late. Uh, maybe we, at the school, they loaded the students late. Maybe you got behind slow traffic or in a construction zone. And then you're trying to make up that time. Rushing is never a good way to drive. Rushing focuses you on how you can hurry, how you can um, cut corners to, to make up time, go a little faster, um, take a different route. But you're focused on the rushing part, not the safety part. Overconfident. Um, you've driven a long time. You can do things a little easier by maybe not setting the parking brake at a stop. You can uh, do a lot of things that are cutting corners when you're overconfident. It, you're invincible. Tracy's safety messages don't pertain to me. I I speed a little bit, but you know it. I'm really careful when I do it, or I don't I don't turn on the overhead lights at that one stop because you know it's just easier to kind of pull off to the side of the road. It's quicker. Um, eventually, those things catch up with you, and I I don't want you to have to be involved in in something that is catastrophic because you didn't take it seriously. Um, I love driving the buses. I, you know, it's, it's great. I'm comfortable doing it. But it's very easy to have these things influence us to make bad choices, unsafe choices. So if you went to a, I'll just cover this up a little bit. Yeah. Um, if you went to a meeting and you said, you know, I have a question for everybody and just, just wanted to see, let's say you went to church or you went to a, a social gathering. You said, how many of you think you're a good driver? I would guess that most people in the room are going to raise their hand and say that, yeah, I'm a good driver. Okay, so let's say there were 50 people in that room. Uh, 40 raised their hands saying they were a good driver. How many of those really were a good driver if you were driving in their neighborhood? How many would you rank as a good driver? Uh, maybe 10, 5? Um, everybody thinks they're a good driver, but it takes work to be a good driver. Uh, a constant work, constant attention. <clears throat> so here's some characteristics of a good driver. And this, this would be a top-notch, almost perfect driver. 
And I know most of us aren't perfect. <laughs> None of us are perfect, but a good driver is cautious. They don't take chances. They don't pull out in front of people. They don't run the yellow lights. They are slow and careful and watchful. A good driver is one who does not cause accidents, but is skillful enough to outguess and avoid potential accidents. So there's two parts there. Your bad driving behavior does not cause accidents. You have good driving behavior, but you're also watching out for that other guy, defensive driving. Okay, you make good decisions opting for safety. And sometimes I'll get up to an intersection and I'll think, oh, I should have gone. But if you're if you're thinking I should have gone, you probably made the better decision to not go um, and, and to be safe. Should I pull into that street or should I go a longer way where it's safer? That's what we've done coming out of Miller Creek. Um, not wanting our buses to be stopped on the railroad tracks, we've rerouted you over on, on uh, behind Walmart there. Uh, it takes about three minutes longer, but it's a safer decision. And that's why that decision was made, is opting for the safest route, not the quickest route. Okay, they're aware, they recognize, they act when things happen. They don't have to react because they've seen the potential and they're ready. So here's your test question. So if you pull out your summary sheet and we'll go through these questions real quick. Okay, your first question is on lanes. You're traveling north on Reserve Street. You should be in this lane when you're turning west onto Mullen Road. There's two turn lanes there. Which lane should you be in? The inside lane, which is the left lane, or the outside lane, which is the right lane? Okay, next one. Railroad. You should open these two things at a railroad crossing. That's pretty easy. Circle to the place. Following distance. Question is, you should be able to do to see this. You should be able to see this on the vehicle ahead of you at a stoplight. Sorry for the bad question there. You should be able to see this on the vehicle ahead of you at a stoplight. Hey, backing. You have to back up and you're driving a minibus, so you have an attendant with you. You should go slow and do this. Pretty easy question. Okay, speed. This is the speed you should drive in a residential area unless it's otherwise marked. So 25, 30, 35. Pre-trip, <clears throat> when you're checking your engine compartment, you're looking for any of these around connections and hoses. Pulling out, so pulling out. When turning onto a main street from a side street, the traffic on the main street should not have to do this or stop for you as you pull out. So they should not have to stop or do this. Lights. <clears throat> this traffic light warns you to slow down and prepare to stop. Post trip. The flag in your back window should stay up or out of the window until you get to this place. And it shouldn't be left down in the back window the entire trip. It should go up when you get on the bus and down 
at this place. <clears throat> Danger zone. After dropping off students at their bus stop, it's what you do before you move the bus. And this is not check your phone. After dropping off students at their stop, it's what you do before you move the bus. Space management. <clears throat> you should go slow and watch all of these with your mirrors when driving in a tight area. Mirrors. These mirrors should show you the area by the back tires and a lane of traffic to either side. So your clue is it's not your crossover mirrors. Okay, railroad tracks. These are the lights you should use when stopping at a railroad crossing. Space management. This is the math question. So get your fingers out. You're going to need your fingers to do this math question. The minimum distance you need between your vehicle and the one in front of you when driving at 55 miles an hour at 645 in the morning, which means it's dark with bare, dry roads. So you're starting with that four seconds following distance and you're adding one second for every hazard or including speed over 45. Okay, backing. Backing is one of the most dangerous things we do. In the afternoon, which location have we asked you to never back up? <clears throat> lights. If you are two bus lengths away from the traffic light when it turns yellow, you should do this. Post trip. The flag in the back window of your bus is to remind you to do this, to check for this, or to do this. Danger zone, just two more. If you have students, if you have a student that walks along the side of your bus after they get off at their stop, you should not move the bus until when. And the, oh, two more, sorry. When your bus is parked between two buses and you're pulling out to the right, the tail swing will be on this side. So which side is the tail swing? Is it to your right as you pull out to the right or is it to the left or is it in the center? Mirrors, last question. These mirrors should allow you to see to the ground and 10 feet in front of your bus and by the front tires on either side. Okay, that old saying that was, I think I'm a good driver, I think should be changed to this new saying, and I'd like you to adopt this saying, I work hard every day to be a good driver because it is a concerted effort. You know, I can get up every, week, every month, and I can tell you what you need to do to be safe driving that bus. I can give you tools, I can give you rules, but ultimately it has to be up to you to make good decisions, to not put yourself, the bus, and your students in jeopardy. Um, that has to be a personal choice. You have the skills to stay out of jeopardy, and jeopardy is the risk of loss, harm, death, or destruction. Um, we as bus drivers have opportunities for this jeopardy risk every day in our profession. 
It's very easy to be complacent, to be overconfident, to be lacking in skills, to not be watchful. As good drivers, we don't put ourselves or our passengers in jeopardy. We watch for those things. Good drivers do not take risks. They make good decisions based on what is safe, not on what is easiest or fastest. So please work hard every day to be a good driver. And you know, I, I hate to brag about you as a driver, you personally, but um, I think I feel that we have the most conscientious, aware, safe drivers um, in the state of Montana. Uh, we try to bring safety issues to your attention. We try to convince you to be safe. And most of the time you take that to heart and, and we do appreciate that. So thank you for being a good driver, for taking it seriously. Um, and we will see you next month in February. Thanks for being here today. And uh, February is coming up. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.